Today at 6, the EU medical regulator gives the AstraZeneca vaccine the green light. Several EU countries had suspended jabs while they tried to find out if there was a link to blood clots. This is a safe and effective vaccine. Its benefits in protecting people from COVID-19 with the associated risks of death and hospitalisation outweigh the possible risks. Here, despite a problem with supplies from India, no vaccination appointments will be cancelled. Our progress along the road to freedom continues unchecked. We remain on track to reclaim the things we love, to see our families and friends again. The Prime Minister says he'll be getting the AstraZeneca jab tomorrow, also tonight. The American private investigator who was paid by The Sun for information on Meghan Markle. He says he broke the law. Just one in six female victims of sexual assault tell the police about it. We'll be asking why they're so reluctant. And in rugby union, Wales have their sights on a Six Nations Grand Slam. And coming up on BBC News, four wickets for Jofra Archer as England's cricketers chase 186 to seal a T20 series win against India. Good evening and welcome to the BBC's News at Six. The EU medical regulator has, in the clearest possible terms, backed the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. It follows a week in which several EU countries suspended their rollout of the jab, citing fears over a link to blood clots in a small number of people. And here the regulator confirmed it's been investigating five cases of rare blood clots, but confirmed its long-standing view that the Oxford jab was safe. There's been some more detail about why there's been a problem with the supply of vaccines to the UK, but the health secretary said no appointments would be cancelled. And tonight, Boris Johnson said, we remain on track to reclaim our lives. Here's our medical editor, Fergus Walsh. Every injection, every vaccine given is another person protected. Half a million people a day are getting immunised at present. In Hull, there was no sign of vaccine hesitancy over the Oxford AstraZeneca jab, which more than a dozen EU countries have suspended using. I was waiting a long time. I'm like in my 60s, so I've only just really got mine, so I was just happy it's finally done. <laughs> I just took on board. This is my appointment. This is what needs doing. This is keeping everyone safe, so let's go ahead and get it done. The UK medicines regulator said after a rigorous review, there was no evidence that blood clots were caused by the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. It looked in particular at five cases of rare clots in the brain among 11 million people immunised by the NHS. All were men under 60, one of whom died. It said given the link was unproven, the benefits of the vaccine far outweighed potential side effects. For those in their 40s, the risk of dying after COVID infection is one in a thousand. As a precautionary measure, it's advising anyone with a headache that lasts more than four days after vaccination to seek medical attention. There is no difference that blood clots in veins are occurring more than would be expected in the absence of vaccination for either vaccine. The public can have every confidence in the thoroughness of our review. Mrs. Imakuk. And in Amsterdam, the European Medicines Agency has come to the same conclusion about the AstraZeneca jab. This is a safe and effective vaccine. Its benefits in protecting people from COVID-19 with the associated risks of death and hospitalisation outweigh the possible risks. The committee also concluded that the vaccine is not associated with an increase in the overall risk of thromboembolic events or blood clots. The Prime Minister, who's 56, will get his first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine tomorrow and said all adults would be offered a jab by the end of July. Our progress along the road to freedom continues unchecked. We remain on track to reclaim the things we love, to see our families and friends again to return to our local pubs, our gyms and sports facilities and, uh, of course, our shops. Uh, all 
of course, as long as the data continue to go in the right direction and we meet our four tests. Those in their 40s seem likely to have to wait until May to get their first vaccine because older people will be getting their second shot and there won't be enough extra doses to go around due to some supply issues. Half of all adults in the UK have now had a first dose of vaccine. The head of the NHS in England, Sir Simon Stevens, got the AstraZeneca jab at Westminster Abbey. Safe and effective vaccines will answer all our prayers to be delivered from this pandemic. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. And our correspondent, Dean McKenzie, is outside the European Medicines Agency in Amsterdam now. So the regulator, the EU regulator, has given the green light, Jean. Is this going to be enough for member countries to restart their vaccination programmes? Well, countries always said that if the regulator did give the green light here this afternoon, they would restart using the vaccine quickly. And this is as close to a green light as I think they were ever going to get today. Italy has already said that it will start reusing the AstraZeneca jab from tomorrow, as have a couple of the other smaller countries. France's prime minister has come out and said he is now going to get um, vaccinated with the AstraZeneca jab. And I think we're going to see other countries follow the regulator was asked this afternoon directly whether European countries should start using the vaccine again. And the answer was crystal clear. We have vaccines that work, they're preventing deaths and they need to be used. It even went on to point out that thousands of people are still dying across Europe every single day from COVID. And this is something that European leaders are all too aware of. They are struggling to vaccinate people fast enough here as many battle what appears to be the onset of a new wave of this virus. Yes, they know they have been super cautious here. This is the in-depth analysis they asked for. It should do a lot to ease their anxieties. All right, Jean, thank you very much. Now, the Prime Minister today said there'd be no changes to the next steps of the roadmap and the loosening of restrictions won't be affected by issues with the vaccine supply. Well, let's talk to Laura Koonsberg, our political editor, who's in Westminster. Laura, so absolutely uh, determined to meet these vaccination targets and no compromises. That's right, George. I mean, after a really choppy few days on the other side of the channel and the news of the squeeze on supply that we were talking about last night, I think the Prime Minister came out today with one goal in mind, to give the country reassurance with a capital R. Number one, first of all, reassurance on safety. And by talking about his own plan to roll up his sleeve tomorrow for his first jab with the AstraZeneca vaccine, he was therefore giving his own very personal endorsement on the safety of the vaccine, which was repeated on many occasions by the top medics who were appearing alongside him. Second of all, he wanted to give reassurance on that supply issue. Yes, we know for various different reasons that Fergus was talking about, there has been a slowdown in the flow of vaccines into the UK. But the Prime Minister didn't want to get into a row about that, either with the EU or with India. And instead, he reiterated that the government is still confident that they'll be able to stick to their targets, with all over 50s getting a first dose by the middle of April and all adults getting their first dose by July, or by the end of July, rather. And what's happened there, really, is that ministers were so pleased this time last week that the vaccine had been going super fast they thought that they might be able to exceed the targets, but the squeeze in supply instead means that they're having to stick to their plans. But last of all, he said repeatedly, this shouldn't mean, none of this should mean a change in the unlock of the country, that gradual reopening of the economy and the country's doors. And I think the fact the Prime Minister came out to front out this message today shows just how much the government is eager that the public's faith in the vaccine isn't dented. All right, Laura, thank you very much. Now, the latest coronavirus figures show there were 6,303 new cases recorded in the latest 24-hour period, which means, on average, the number of new cases reported per day in the last week is 5,601. The number of patients in hospital with COVID continues to fall, now down to 7,218. There were 95 deaths reported of people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test, which means... On average, 108 deaths were reported every day in the past week from coronavirus, taking the total number of deaths so far to 125,926. 
On to vaccinations now, and 462,246 people had their first dose of a COVID vaccine in the latest 24-hour period, which takes a total of people who have now had their first jab to more than 25.7 million, meaning 49% of the UK adult population have now received their first vaccination. And nearly 1.9 million people have had both doses of the vaccine. Now, the Health Secretary has announced an additional £6.6 .6 billion of funding for the NHS in England. The money will be spent on continuing to deal with the coronavirus, but there was also a pledge to start tackling the ever-growing backlog of procedures that have been postponed during the pandemic. Our health editor, Hugh Pym, has been hearing from one hospital boss about the scale of the task ahead. This experience was like being in a little bit of a hotel. No. Getting feedback from patients. Marcel Levy tours wards at University College London hospitals. Hey guys. He's both consultant and chief executive and soon will head back to his native Holland to become the Dutch government's Hi. chief scientific advisor. Hello. He's full of How praise for the work of staff, yeah. but he says the NHS was not well set before the pandemic with waiting lists growing steadily. So Covid cancellations have made an existing problem a lot worse. Covid is actually a magnifying glass making very clear that the capacity in the NHS was not sufficient already for years. And that has now become very, very obvious. It's going to take, I'm afraid, a very long time to get where we want to be. Does it need more money just to get through these uh, procedures? Yes, of course it will take more money. And of course we will try to do this as efficient as possible. But you can only treat all those patients if you introduce even more weekend work, working, evening working, extra shifts, um, extra operating theatre time. An extra £6.6 .6 billion has now been allocated to the NHS in England, some of which will be used to help cut waiting lists. There will be proportionate increases for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. I'll have a, a nice warm bath when I come home from work. Chris can only hope it'll make a difference. He was keen on sport, but arthritis over the last few years has made that impossible. He's been told he needs a knee replacement and has been waiting nearly a year. It's frustration, absolute frustration that, you know, I, I, I lay awake at night worrying about getting up to work next day and thinking, am I going to be OK? Am I, not, am I going to be able to get down steps in the morning and, and, and all that? And I, I get that. I, I just, it's just frustration, to be honest. The charity Versus Arthritis said it was vital that some of the new money would be focused on cutting waiting times for joint replacements. Marcel Levy believes the NHS is a very strong organisation. It just needs to build up capacity now to cope with the impact of the next pandemic. Hugh Pym, BBC News. A Los Angeles-based private investigator says he was paid by the Sun newspaper to investigate Meghan Markle and her family in the early days of her relationship with Prince Harry. Daniel Portley Hanks says he unlawfully obtained detailed private information about her, including her social security number, as part of a dossier. News UK, the publisher of the Sun, except they paid Mr Hanks but insist they never asked for or knew of any unlawful activity. Our media editor, Amal Rajan's report, contains some flashing images. We all know what the British press can be like, and it was destroying my mental health. I was really? like, this is toxic. Prince Harry has long had a fraught relationship with Britain's tabloid press, as he told James Corden recently. He is suing both the former publishers of The Sun and The Daily Mirror over allegations of phone hacking and other illegal activity before 2011. Witnesses at the Leveson inquiry into press ethics in 2012 included celebrities, politicians and a former editor of The Sun and News of the World. Since 2015, Rebecca Brooks has been the boss of The Sun's publisher, Rupert Murdoch's News UK, and was later cleared on all charges of phone hacking. On page 9 of her first written witness statement to the inquiry, dated October 2011, she said of private investigators, the industry cracked down on the use of investigators until, I believe, their use is now virtually extinct. So we're going to look at privacy and harassment law. Four years after Leveson, in 2016, Meghan Markle was working as an actor in the legal drama Suits. Shortly after Meghan's relationship with Prince Harry was revealed, a private investigator based in California, now retired, was paid by The Sun to get detailed personal information about her and her family. He believes some of what he then did was unlawful. 
in accessing a particular one-stop database as a licensed private investigator and giving a false statement about what he was using the data for, Dan O'Hanks breached federal law. Pretty much everything that I found out, they could find out themselves uh, using, you know, legal means, with the exception of the social security numbers. When you have that information, it's the key to the kingdom. You know, I mean, uh, especially social security number, because you can contact any other thing. You can contact the bank. You can contact, you know, phone companies. It is important to stress there is no evidence that there was such misuse in this instance. The BBC has seen and corroborated this so-called comprehensive report on Meghan and her family, for which Hanks was paid by The Sun, as well as the remittances for payments that he received from News UK for this and many other reports. It was in this period, in November 2016, that Prince Harry issued a trenchant statement condemning the media. Hanks says The Sun wrote to him in 2012, instructing him to act within the law, and he later confirmed this in his invoices but he feels they could have done more. Did anyone from The Sun at any point say, we've got some concerns about how you get this information? No, they never asked. Uh, they didn't care. Is Hanks a reliable source? A sometime actor and Vietnam veteran, he was jailed four times, including for extortion, and had been a private investigator for decades. A statement from news group newspapers says, the Sun made a legitimate request for contact details relating to Meghan Markle, for which Mr Hanks was paid $250. They say he was instructed and undertook in writing to act lawfully and that the information provided could not and did not raise any concerns. They also say that they did not request her social security number and that none of the information was used for any unlawful practice. Hanks was initially being approached by a freelance journalist who was previously sentenced for phone hacking and now reports on press ethics. His website is funded by supporters of press reform and spun off from a media group that has received funding from the likes of Max Mosley and Hugh Grant. He paid Hanks for access to his documents. This story definitely sticks out in, in the post-Leverson world because it, 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 it's, uh, it's taken place five years after we thought these practices had been had, had, had stopped. Hank says watching Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah Winfrey prompted his confession. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle might well be listening to you right now. What would you like to say to them directly? I'm deep, deeply sorry for what I did. If your lawyers need to talk to me to help you with these cases, I'm ready to give you what I know. Amol Rajan, BBC News. Fewer than one in six female victims of sexual assault in England and Wales reported it to the police. That's according to the Office for National Statistics. The figures for the year to last March highlight the hundreds of thousands of women who experience sexual violence every year. Our special correspondent, Lucy Manning, has been talking to two women, one who told the police about an attack and another who didn't. Sarah Everard's family still don't know exactly what happened to her. As the inquest into her death opened today, the 33-year-old's relatives heard experts are still unsure how she died. A second post-mortem has taken place. The tragedy of one has amplified the experiences of many. Data that asks people about their experience of crime has shone a light on the numbers of young women affected by the most serious sexual assaults. Latest figures show over the last three years, around one in 40 women aged between 16 and 24 experienced rape or assault by penetration. Fewer than one in six reported it to the police. And overall, there were more than three quarters of a million victims last year of sexual assault. Those figures have actually gone down from the year before, but four times as many women were affected than men. Stephanie Tubrit is one who didn't report her sexual assaults. She's chosen to waive her anonymity. It doesn't surprise me. Um, I feel like if I was to report someone for shoplifting, they'd be dealt with a lot quicker than a woman who says she's been abused or has been raped or assaulted. And it's quite sad, really, because a lot of women are ignored and their experiences are brushed under the mat. Honey Lyons was raped in Cambridge, She's also waived her anonymity. 
I can tell you that most of my friends have some kind of sort story about being sexually assaulted, um, either by someone that they don't know or someone they do know. So, like, to me, sort of one in 40 probably doesn't seem that much. She did tell police and her attackers were jailed. I think my advice to people would always be to go and do it and report this crime because it's the more it's reported, hopefully the more likely we will be to like reduce the stigma around it. After pressure from campaigners, the police will now record misogyny as a hate crime. Sisters united will never be defeated. It's hoped this will encourage more women to report their attacks. Lucy Manning, BBC News. And the time is 20 minutes past six. Our top story this evening. Europe's medical regulator says the AstraZeneca vaccine is safe and effective. And coming up, we hear Zoe's story of bereavement and the impact of grief on her education. Coming up on Sports Day on BBC News, two more wins for Rachel Blackmore on day three at the Cheltenham Festival, including victory on board Alaho in the Ryanair chase. Now, one way or another, all our lives have been touched by the coronavirus. After a year of disruption, how easy will it be for us to get back to the normality we've all craved? In the latest in our series since the first lockdown, Rita Chakrabarti has been speaking to three people about what lockdown has meant for them. Spring is always an awakening, but this year that need for renewal is intense. Twelve months of lockdown have forced shutdown on many people, until perhaps now. In front of you and I put my heart out. For Maria, a teacher and aspiring singer, life in lockdown has turned many certainties upside down. I never used to worry as much about everything. And then I suddenly found myself in, in a circle where really everything seemed quite quite uncertain, everything seemed really difficult to plan ahead and even think about what you're doing next week or the week after. Maria and her fiancé Chris had a wedding planned for last summer, but the stop-start of lockdowns has forced them to cancel it twice. That's what I think really triggered all my worries and anxieties. There has been a little bit of guilt at times when I've spent sleepless nights worrying about the wedding, whether it was going to go ahead and thinking, actually, there are bigger things out there that are happening. Lockdown has made some of us more anxious and less confident as people. But there have been gains too. We listen to the bird song more. We speak to neighbours that we didn't previously know. We are more connected to our surroundings and our communities. For some, the pandemic has meant new roots. Sam Walker and family moved house for more space. When we were in London, we lived in an upstairs masonette. We were inside the flat, you know, with no outside space apart from the really small balcony that we had. So that really was the motivation to get a house with a garden. Sam is a makeup artist who's seen all her work disappear. It's changed her as a person. Before, I had a lot more focus on my work and my career, and that has flipped 100%. You know, so now I realise that you know, where I get my values from my family and my home. Did you feel lonely? A little bit, because I didn't have as many people around me, because I was used to, like, as going to school, I was used to having quite a lot of people around me and also being in public. For artist Joel Chitty Sydenham, the changing landscape of lockdown life has led to shifting perspectives of his own. I, I don't think anybody knew it was going to go on for a year. So I, I genuinely, I felt like it was going to be two or three months and then everything would be fine. Being forced to slow down has forced me to grow up as a human being and as an artist and as a teacher too. Many young people, he says, feel frustrated and even angry about the last year. It is an emergency. It is a pandemic. Like, no one, it's unprecedented. And I don't think anybody young feels like they've had a, a say. They don't feel heard or they don't feel like their opinions have been valued. Despite the frustrations, Joel is hopeful. I have a strong belief that the world will go back to normal and all those things will, they've just been postponed. They haven't really been cancelled. This spring, we're taking tentative steps towards our old lives and our old selves without really knowing if either are entirely retrievable. 
Rita Chakrabarti, BBC News, Elton. The BBC has announced it's moving more of its services out of London in order better to reflect all parts of the UK. More programmes will be commissioned and made away from the capital. Six Music, for example, is heading to Salford. Newsnight on BBC Two, the Today programme and PM on radio will be presented regularly from across the UK. Now, children who lose a close relative within two months of sitting a major school exam in England are entitled to a 5% increase in their grades. That doesn't go far enough, says the new children's commissioner. Zoe lost her mother during lockdown and she's been telling us her story through the BBC Young Reporter Scheme. It really started to get on top of me throughout lockdown. And it was a really difficult challenge to continue completing schoolwork, then dealing with the emotional aspect of everything. My mum was incredible. She was so positive about everything and she cared about everyone and she never really put herself before anything. Since mum died, I found out that pupils like me can apply for a 5% increase in their exam grade, but only if a close relative has passed away within two months. <laughs> Hi. One bereavement charity says pupils like me need more support. So what I would like to see happen, uh, as you're doing, um, is people become engaged over a much longer term. Please, please carry on asking the questions. The guidance on exam grades is set by the Joint Centre for Qualifications. They declined an interview, but sent me a statement. We have a lot of sympathy for students who have lost loved ones the usual special consideration process will not apply this year as there are no exams. JCQ will provide further guidance about how to take adverse circumstances into account this summer, later this month. I think the statement I received from the Joint Centre for Qualifications was really quite empty. There was no sort of real information in it at all. And I think I'm happy that they did mention they are willing to support bereaved children, but really not enough is being done and the statement they provided really lacked a lot of clarity. My mum brought me up to be a positive person. I'd like to be a voice for other people's going through bereavement and that means putting more questions to people who represent us. So if the time limit of about two months over the grade uplift is still used in some way over the next few years, do you think that that's fair? I would like to see uh, that 5% changed and I think we need to so not put a too much cap on it and I think it should be a centre assessed grade by the people who know you best and know what you're capable of. In the future if nothing's done then I will be willing to go and try and contact the Department for Education, speak to the Children's Commissioner again and really make sure that something is done because it's an, a really important issue that needs sorting out really quickly. Zoe there, ending her report on bereavement. And for more information on dealing with issues similar to Zoe's, you can go to the BBC Action Line. Wales are preparing for the biggest rugby match of the year so far. On Saturday evening, they play France with a chance not just to win the Six Nations, but to complete a clean sweep of victories, the Grand Slam, as Joe Wilson reports. What is spring without revival? What is rugby union without Wales? They're coming left. They do the They're on the brink of a perfect Six Nations, just France left to beat. Yet 2020 was one of their worst calendar years, with seven defeats. And sport always needs to surprise us, doesn't it, Jonathan? That's, it wouldn't be sport if it weren't surprises. Well, that's Wales. That's Wales, Joe. You know, that, yep. that is Wales this year. Everyone says, I speak to my Irish friends and my English friends, and they go, how, oh, how? a Wales in this position and we all go we don't actually know but you know they are there they've they've had to do what they had to do and 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 they're on the top of the table and they're going for the grand slam well Wales began the Six Nations by beating Ireland here in Cardiff over the tournament they've evolved there's a new coach New Zealander Wayne Pivak some new players the exciting Lewis Rees summit uncatchable and yet Wales have retained their traditional heart and soul and voice. <laughs> Alan Wynne-Jones will equal a world record this weekend, the most rugby matches played for one country. Now, imagine he was your captain. Alan Wynne's just that true professional, really, and um, it's great, great achievement for him to equal Richie McCaw this weekend and get 148 
a test caps for your country and obviously added with his nine Lions caps as well. He's just a phenomenal professional and uh, he, he deserves every accolade he gets. In the Six Nations, Wales have done the Grand Slam more often than anyone, four times so far. But this spring, who thought Wales would be this close to perfection? Joe Wilson, BBC News. The weather now with Thomas Schaffernacker. Hello. George, hello. Good evening to you. The weather's fairly quiet out there at the moment, and that's how it's going to stay over the next few days. For most of us, fairly chilly. Having said that, today in Scotland, it was actually the warmest day of the year so far in Edinburgh. The Met Office says the temperatures got up to around 19 degrees Celsius thanks to this high pressure uh, which sent the clouds from the north. The clouds went over the mountains, they dried out and we had some sunshine across the lowlands whereas the rest of the country or, or the vast majority of us were stuck underneath the cloud. And There's been some rain around too. That will continue through this evening and overnight particularly across these eastern areas are so quite damp here whereas across central and western Scotland there will be some clearer skies tonight so a little bit colder in the morning around three degrees for most of us it'll be about uh, six or seven so it starts off fairly overcast for the majority of the UK tomorrow but the thinking is that as we go through the morning into the afternoon the skies will clear after a damp start in East Anglia and the southeast so there will be some sunshine for places like Norwich, London, possibly Southampton too and also the warm spot in western Scotland maybe 15 in Glasgow but for many of us it is going to remain fairly cloudy. That takes us into Saturday and Saturday is the spring equinox so the first day of astronomical spring. High pressure is still very close by and that high pressure is going to hang around for quite a while so if you look at the outlook into next week actually not an awful lot of change at all. Fairly cloudy with that high pressure and temperatures around 11 to 13 degrees for most of us. George, over to Thomas, you. Thomas, thank you very much. And that's all from the BBC's News at Six. Now it's time for the news where you are. Goodbye.